rise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome those watching this TV program this morning to stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. In 1 Corinthians, the Bible says that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. In Ephesians chapter 2, if you'll turn over there with me, please. Starting with verse 1, the Apostle Paul's letter to the uh, church at Ephesus. And of course, uh, this, this book extends to the church in whatever age it may be in until Jesus comes. Again, a second time. The Apostle Paul said, And you hath he quickened, or he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. And he's talking about all of us, all the people in the world, we were all dead in our trespasses and sins. Had we not <clears throat> forsook them sins and obeyed the gospel, repented of our sins, been baptized into Jesus Christ, have those sins washed away, we would all die, be dead in our sins, and would die and go to hell in that lake of fire for all eternity. But you see, God has the power to make us alive, and He did. When each of us repented of our sins and were baptized, He made us alive. We were dead to sins, but as Jesus arose from the dead, so did you and I. We arose from the dead. <clears throat> and the Bible teaches that where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. We were called children of disobedience. If you have not been baptized into Jesus Christ, the Bible claims that we are children of disobedience. And we walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, which would be Satan himself, among whom also we all had our conversations or our lifestyles in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Yes, we need to stop and look what God has brought us from. We don't need to look back and say that them are the good old days, and I'm sure that everyone had some days in their life that they could remember that was clean and pure and good. But for the most part of it, we're not looking back at those uh, days that we walked in the course of this world, in the course of the prince and power of the air, and say they were the good old days. But we're to look ahead in the future for those good old days. And we start by now as we're baptized into Christ and we walk according to what the Bible teaches us. The good old days begin then. When we get to heaven, you talking about good old days, we can say that. <clears throat> Among them also whom we have a conversation in time past and lust of our flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind, we were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You see, we've been baptized into Christ. We have forsaken that old life, that old person. But there are many who have not, you see. And we walked in those, that way of life just as they do right now. But praise be to God that He gave us each the opportunity to escape that old wicked sinful life and become a part of His family, His people, a part of His kingdom. But God, in verse 4, who is rich in mercy for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together or made us alive together with Christ. By grace are you saved and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We need to stop and look at that. Those heavenly places are not only extended to where Jesus is right now at the throne of God and the, the new Jerusalem, but those heavenly places 
mean right now in this world. We as the church, God's people, the kingdom of God. God has raised up for us up from the dead, being dead to our sins, to be alive for Him as He did Jesus. And we are quickened together with Christ. And we are made to sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Right now this morning, Sunday, the first day of the week, is not a physical day. It's a divine day. It was a day that was mentioned to the revelation that God gave to His Son Jesus when He came to this earth. And He delivered unto His twelve apostles. And uh, as the Holy Spirit moved them, they taught it to those who would obey the, the Christ, obey the gospel. He taught to the church, the early Christians, and we're still being taught that today. Right now, in this building, is not the kingdom of God. It's not the church. Those who have been baptized into Jesus Christ is the church. And because we're sitting here this morning, because we're singing songs of praise to God, because the Bible teaches us so, because we pray, and because we have preaching and teaching going on, we are made to sit together in a heavenly place right this morning. Now, there may be parts of this old building that we don't like. It needs to be fixed. But in the spiritual eyes, what God sees is us, not this building. And we were made to sit together with Christ in heavenly places. When we think about heavenly places, we think about where that great choir of angelic songs are being sung. We think about those who lived and died in the faith are at. We think about the river of life. We think about eternal life, never crying, no more pain, no more sickness, no more death. But I tell you, that begins right here in this life. It doesn't begin there. We are made to sit in heavenly places. Anytime you open up God's Word and you begin reading and you begin studying, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Every time that you pray in whatever way that you do, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Every time that you help someone, you encourage someone, you tell someone that you love them. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Anytime you do something for the Lord, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's what God, His Word has said. Now take a look at your life. Take a look at what you do for Christ. How you give yourself over to Him. How much you love Him. What you do, what the Bible says. And you can just uh, have, imagine in your mind that you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. You see, it begins right here in this life. It doesn't begin when we get to up there with Jesus. He goes on to say, in verse 7, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. And the good works are found in the Bible that God gives us to do. He goes on to say, if we'll move on down to verse 19. Now it's talking about the church. Every individual is baptized into Jesus Christ. And are built, <clears throat> now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. You are no more strangers to God and I. You're no more strangers to the kingdom of God. You're no more strangers to heavenly things. You're no more strangers to the eternal life. You see, we're, no, we're not foreigners anymore, but we're fellow citizens. You know... Uh, Bonnie and Nene are citizens of Dillsboro. Joanne and I are citizens of Jefferson County, Hanover, Jefferson County. And we can go on with other people. They're citizens of this county, of this city. Yeah, you might be a citizen of Dillsboro and some other city and county. But if you've been baptized into Jesus Christ, you're a fellow citizen with the saints. You see, that makes you a saint. I don't care what anybody says. The Bible says, God says you're a saint. And we need to recognize ourselves as being saints of God. Okay? And the Bible says, and the household of God. 
We're in a household. Yeah, we all they have kids been married, hopefully, and raised up a family. And, and you know, the Bible teaches that the husband's head of the, wife, the house and the wife is to rear the children up. And it's a household. Well, when we come up out of that water grave of baptism, we have a Father in heaven now. And we're His children. And we're of the household of God. You see, we ought to look at ourselves that way. As a household of God. I'm a son and daughter of God. Yeah, when we say that name, Jesus, the Son of God, well, He's not no longer God's only son <laughs> and daughter. You and I are if we've been baptized into Jesus Christ and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ Himself being the chief cornerstone. What a wonderful plan God set up. It didn't just happen that way. I'm telling you, God, when He spoke it, He spoke it into existence. He set it in order, in order by the very power of His Word. It was done so. Nothing took place in the New Testament Scriptures that was out of order. You see, God has the order of things. Whether it be good or bad in New Testament Scriptures, it was by the order of God, by the power of His Word. And we were built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. You see, that's where God ordered it. A foundation would be made. You know when you build a house or some building, it's best to build a foundation first if you want the house to stand and be in proper condition. Well, so it is in our Christian life. So it is in the church, the kingdom of God. It needs a foundation if it wants to stand and be in proper condition. And we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, which were in the early church because the whole Word of God was not yet complete. They did not have what you and I have today. You see, the apostles and prophets were temporary offices in the church. They were only needed until the last apostle wrote the last book of the New Testament, which is the book of Revelation. No longer does God need those uh, apostles and prophets, and there aren't any more today, you see. But also the Bible says that Jesus Christ himself been the chief cornerstone. Yeah, who made up the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone of that foundation? Jesus himself, okay? He didn't leave it up to anybody else. Nobody else could do it. God would not allow anyone else to be the chief cornerstone because it would not stand. And in God's great plan and the order of things, in verse 21 it says, in whom all the building fitly framed together, or all the Christians fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. Yeah, in the Old Testament, you know, they began out with the tent city, okay? then a tabernacle, then a temple. But in all three, there was a holy place and a holy of holies. And only the priest could go into the holy place, but only the high priest could go into the holy of holies. And I'm telling you, it was sacred to them. It was told to them that no one but the, pre the high priest could go into the holy of holies or they would die. So they, because they feared what God said, they stayed away from it. I'm telling you this morning that you and I, when we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we become that holy temple, you see. The Holy of Holies is in here. Jesus entered into the Holy of Holies, seated at the Father's right hand, making intercession for us. Get back to where I was here. In verse 22, "...in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Holy Spirit." You and I are built into a habitation together. Okay, it didn't do it one by one, two by two, three by three. The whole family of God, wherever the church is today in this world. In this world. God in the order of things, God as He spoke it by the power of His Word, has brought you and me into His kingdom. And He is building us together. Well, that's what He wants, okay? God will never do anything against our will for us. God will never, never make us do anything. He wants us to do it because we love Him. We want to. We desire to. 
And then He can work in our lives. But apart from that desire, that willingness to want Him to, it will never happen. We'll never be a part of that there, uh, that there uh, temple in whom you are so builded together for inhabitation of God through the Holy Spirit. When you're baptized into Jesus Christ, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, okay? Can't you see it's all falling in place? All the ingredients that God said that would make that happen, you and I have when we're baptized in Jesus Christ. It's all there. Everything is there to make happen what God said would happen. Only if you and I let it, let it happen that way. Only if you and I let Him have His way in our life. Only if we do what He says in His Word. That all, all that will come together as a holy habitation of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, when we hear the name of Jesus, I'm, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 2, when we hear the name of Jesus, we ought to be excited. When we hear other people talk about Jesus, we ought to be excited. You're talking about having emotions or have a good feeling. When we hear about Jesus, when we read about Jesus, when we uh, talk about Jesus, when we pray, there ought to be excitement taking place in, within us. There ought to be emotions taking place. Um, Emotions taking place in our life. We ought to be excited. There ought to be a good feeling taking place because of that. Because there's no other name under heaven whereby it was given to us whereby we can be saved. Acts chapter 12 says so. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Then the name of Jesus. In verse 6 of Philippians chapter 2. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself, speaking of Jesus, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. You see, Jesus didn't come out and being so egotistic that people couldn't be around him. He didn't come out and use words that were above people's heads that when he used them that well, I can't understand that, so I'm not going to listen. He didn't come out in a three-piece suit, and when he walked around you, you wondered, is he too good for me or not? He did it by willingness. He did it on purpose. The Bible says there, he did it on purpose. He made himself of no reputation. He took upon himself, him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. He did that on purpose so that you and I would want, would desire to listen to Him. We would feel comfortable around Jesus, you see. I don't know about you. I know there's people in New York City, and that's just one city. They wear three-piece suits and might have diamonds on all fingers. And there be, might be multi, uh, multitudes of people that wear the same kind of clothing. And I just bet that they're comfortable with each other. But let have one then come down here in the southern part of Indiana with that same kind of lifestyle. And we would not feel comfortable around them and they wouldn't feel comfortable around us, you see. Jesus on purpose took on himself of no reputation, became a form, in the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, Jesus set the example of being humble, being obedient. Jesus set the example of how we should be desiring and longing to leave this life and go into the next, you see. Death should not be something that's so horrible to us that's like watching a, a Frankenstein movie or a Dracula movie or some scary monster movie. No, when we talk about death as a Christian, we ought to talk the way Jesus did. We ought to talk about the way the Bible talks about it. You see, five seconds after we take our last breath, we're going to be standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And He's not going to judge us. He's just going to pass the sentence. See, we're being judged right now here in this life, you and I are. We're being judged by the Word of God. The Bible says so. The Bible's judging you and me right now. How, what are we doing with Jesus here in this life? 
will make a difference what he does with us in the next life. You see, we're being judged by God's word, the Bible says. In John, in chapter 8, the word of God is judging you and me. Every time you and I read and hear the word of God preached and taught, it's checking you and me out. Am I praying like I should be praying? Am I opening up God's Word and, and reading and studying like I should be? Am I treating my brothers and sisters in Christ like I should? Am I giving my tithes and offerings like I should? Am I meeting on the first day of the week and partaking of the Lord's Supper like I should be? Is my language like the Bible says it ought to be? Is my actions like the Bible says they ought to be? Is my marriage like the Bible says it ought to be? And we go on and on and on and on full of the New Testament Scriptures where the Bible, where God through His Word is teaching you and me how to be a Christian, how to live the Christian life, how to be a part of the family that the Father in Heaven is well pleased with. You see, that's what He wants. That's what He's trying to teach us. It's our responsibility to use the resources that God gives us so that which God said would happen can happen in our lives. Verse 9 there in Philippians chapter 2, Wherefore God also has highly exalted Him, high ex highly exalted Jesus, and no one else. There is no angel in heaven, ever was or ever will be, that will be a highly exalted as high as Jesus. You see? Not Satan, no king, no president, no person on this earth, I don't care who you are. You'll never be, and you'll never come close to, you'll never be compared to be highly exalted as God did Jesus. You see, the name of Jesus, wherefore God has highly exalted him, given him a name which is above every name. Jesus is more powerful than any king, any president, any amount of money, any power on this earth, any angel. He's more powerful than Satan. The Bible says in 1 John that greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. The Holy Spirit, the Godhead. I'm telling you, the New Testament Scriptures teaches in different places that God the Father, the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit abides in this temple. And greater is he that's in you than he's that's in the world. He's talking about Satan. God is more powerful than Satan. And God has given Jesus a name which is above every name. Yeah, when we, we think about, I know most of us, we, we, we love uh, Donald Trump and, and what he's doing and, and you can look at things he does and, and, and a lot of it reflects what the Bible teaches. But I'm telling you, Jesus has a name been given to him by God the Father that is above Donald Trump's name, anyone's name. And when we hear, when we hear the name of Jesus Christ, we ought to be excited yeah, when Donald Trump comes on the news, I pay attention to it. Versus, you know, I'm flickering here where I'm thinking about something else. I pick up something else or I'm eating, whatever the case may be. When Donald Trump comes on the news, I listen to it. Versus um, George Bush. I believe George Bush sold us out to the United Nations for that one world government. He says he did. I don't pay attention to him, but when Donald Trump comes on, I pay attention to the news. Well, when I hear Jesus' name, I get excited because I know he's the one that laid his life down for me and us. I know he is the only one that can bring eternal life to every one of us if we will obey him. Only Jesus can do that. And God has given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Yeah, I won't mind, I won't mind uh, bending my knee to Jesus. I'm not going to bend my knee to Satan. I'm not going to bow to, down before uh, Donald Trump either. I'm not going to bow down before some angel either. You see, but when it comes to Jesus, I would love to bow down before him and do. Bow down to Jesus doesn't mean you just get on your knees and bow down to him. Bow down to Jesus means you have taken his word and you have studied it and you know what he wants from you and you begin doing it. That's bowing down to Jesus. 
When you confess Jesus, you confess the truth that you've learned from His Word. You tell people the truth about every subject, you see. And if the Bible doesn't talk about that subject, we ought to be quiet about it. Don't say nothing about it. But if the Bible does, tell them what the Bible says. Forget what you and I think it ought to say or ought to be. Tell them what Jesus says, the one who died for them. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, this is Paul's letter to the young evangelist Timothy. And Paul is instructing Timothy, okay? He's not instructing, in this letter, he's not, when it was written, he was not instructing the whole church. He was instructing Timothy, the young evangelist. And then he commands Timothy to instruct the church with it, okay, in that order. In 2 Timothy in chapter 4, by this time the apostle Paul was an old man, hardly able to get around. And no wonder, <laughs> look what happened to him. If you read the book of Acts, Second Corinthians, look what happened to him. Look what he went through for the cause of Christ to make sure that you and I have the complete written word of God. Starting with verse 1. Now he's talking to Timothy. Paul said, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall, be, who shall judge the quick and the dead, or the living and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, he's talking to Timothy, the evangelist. Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. You preach it when it's popular and when it's not popular. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know, I could stand up here and don't know if I can or not, but preach like Joe Holstein. I think that's his name, isn't it? Holstein. And he's a magnificent speaker, okay? He's a dynamic speaker. And what he talks about, yes, he can lift people up and cause them to be excited. But he doesn't lift them up with the truth. See, that's the only thing wrong with that. And uh, that's what happens when we listen to false teaching. When we listen to things that don't make our ears, it tickle our ears, you see. If I stood up here and tickled your ears, you would listen, Okay? Uh, you wouldn't have other things on your mind. You wouldn't be doing other things. If I was tickling your ears, you'd be listening. If I was a comedian and I was saying funny things, you would listen and laugh, okay? But I am preaching and teaching God's Word. And it ought to be the same thing. The excitement ought to be great that you want to listen to it, you see. Because these are the words to eternal life. When you take your last breath, this is what's going to be. What's going to happen and take place next was written in God's Word and nowhere else. So Timothy said, or Paul said to Timothy, For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, the, wor the domination world is full of preachers and teachers who tickle the ears of the people. Even in the Lord's church that's happening. Now we might be really, 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 really small, okay? But I am trying my best. I ask God to help me. I study to make sure I'm preaching what the Bible says. And if that's a cause for being small, well, praise God. If there's something else wrong, then it's my fault, okay? It's our fault. In verse 4, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Just what I said a while ago. It'd be more exciting to hear a comedian or someone's tick on your ears than hear someone preach and teach the Word of God. But watch thou in all things. Now he's talking to the Timothy, the young evangelist. But watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. 
Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Paul knows that it's close for him to take his last breath. He knows that. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I would be ashamed to try to compare my life to his. I couldn't say none of those things, okay, of what he went through. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Now, you see, Paul's talking about his own life now. But there are inspired words. They came from the Holy Spirit. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day. And not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Do you know that says something about us? When Jesus appears, what's our attitude going to be when he appears in the sky? Are we going to be ashamed of? Are we going to say, wait, 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 I need more time? Are we going to think about all the things we did that wasn't according to God's will and, and let that get us down? Are we going to be happy, excited? Are we going to run up front, stand our arm out, be hard on anybody else's and say, get me first, get me first? That's what Paul's talking about. He was excited about dying in the physical life. He did so much he was telling to the young evangelist Timothy. Because he knew, okay? He was excited about it. He was excited about however the pain was. He was excited about... He, di he didn't know or care whether there's going to be friends and neighbors and family around and they're all going to be mourning because he's taking his last breath. I'm telling you, he was excited because there was a crown of righteousness laid up for him by God waiting for him at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And he went on to say, but you're not me only. Hey folks, not just for Paul, but for everyone else who loves his appearing. Each one of us has a crown of righteousness, a crown of life waiting for us at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Think about it. We're all going to die. There's some day we're going to take our last breath. And there's a crown of life waiting for us in heaven. It's there waiting for us. Waiting for us to come to it. You know, it's not going to be where someone dies and body goes back to the grave. It's not going to be where someone dies and uh, it's going to be uh, hopeless and there's going to be dread and there's going to be pain and sorrow and doom and gloom. No, I'm telling you something. There's better. It's a better than a birthday party. It's better and exciting than a wedding. It's better than going on the greatest vacation there ever was. It's better than uh, earning a million dollars a week. It's going to be exciting when you take your last breath. Because there's a crown of righteousness, a crown waiting for you and me at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Every one of us. We'll get the same way Paul did. Same way the other apostles did. You see? It's waiting for you and me. When I take my last breath, that's what I want to be thinking about. You see? I'll say goodbyes to my family here on earth and my friends. But I want to shut my eyes thinking about getting my hands on that crown of life. You see, five seconds after you die, you're going to be standing there and that crown of life is waiting for you. You see, it's not going to be that bad. I mean, think on, about, on those terms. It's not going to be that bad at all. It's going to be more exciting. If we would read these scriptures many times and fill our mind with it, we would be able to talk like Paul did. Paul commanded the young Timothy, the young evangelist, to teach it unto the congregation that he resided over. That message was to be teached to every congregation from then until Jesus comes back. You see, my last verse of Scripture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Starting with verse 13. Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica said these words. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep or that have already passed on, 
that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them, which, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, or the power of God's word, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord at the appearing of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep, or they have already gone on to be with the Lord. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. These are words of comfort. And we need to hear them many, many times. We live in a world of doom and gloom, darkness. Satan is prince and power of the air. Satan is God of this world. And he's trying to separate us from God. He's trying to destroy the church. He's trying to destroy God's book. It's up to you and, my, you and me to preserve it. We can overcome. But we must comfort one another with these words. We must have that hope. We must know about that hope. We must know that that hope is there waiting for us. As Paul said, there's a crown of life waiting for me at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This morning, if you're not a Christian... The Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents of their sins. Repentance is a change of mind and conduct towards the way that you're living, and you turn towards God. The Bible says one must be baptized by immersion to have your sins washed away and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not help you speak in tongues and do miracles, but help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and His Word unto the end. If you are a Christian this morning, God's speaking to you through His Word and through the Holy Spirit. You know that your life isn't like it ought to be. Well, that's sin, my friend. That's sin. Sin is the only thing that will separate us from God for all eternity. And you need to repent. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we'll confess our sins to Him or Jesus, He is just and He's faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in His arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior.